Hey guys, you're listening to episode 292 of The Modern Acre. This week, we're talking to Anthony Howcroft, who's the founder and CEO of Swarm Engineering. Swarm is the primary way for organizations to identify, define, and solve challenges. They're changing the way the world thinks about problem solving. Their focus today is to help people solve operational challenges in their agri-food supply chain for multi-million dollar savings. You're listening to The Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. This episode of the Modern Acre podcast is presented by DPH Biologicals. For nearly a decade, organic and conventional growers have trusted SP1 Classic as an integral part of their crops fertility program. Produced in the U.S., DPH Bio's full biologicals portfolio includes everything from fertilizers, stimulants, controls and degraders, many of which are OMRI listed for organic production. Visit dphbio.com and be sure to mention you heard it on the Modern Acre podcast. So Tim, we're, you know, we're always listening to podcasts, always trying to better ourselves, listening to a lot of business podcasts, always going back and forth, sending us good good content. Um, also with the the health and fitness podcasts, um, we've become big fans of Andrew Huberman. He's got one of the biggest podcasts around now. I'm like, I eat up his content. He's so good. I think it's time that we just do just a health and fitness check in. Like, what's what's working for you right now, Tim? What 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 are you what are you focused on? Yeah, thanks for checking in, Ty. I really appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. So, as you know, have the the garage gym set up. So, typically, getting my morning workouts in before work, before heading to the farm. So, trying to do that five six days a week. I subscribe to a workout routine that's been super helpful. It's through a a gym out of Salt Lake City called Jim Jones, but they have basically plans where they map out all your workouts and you have an app where you can track all of your your lifts and workouts. So that's been super helpful. My wife and I came up with a little challenge. Both of us were trying to lose a little weight and trying to keep ourselves accountable. So we have this little checklist every day of drinking a gallon of water, reading a certain amount of a book, eating pretty clean and getting a workout in. So we're trying to compete with each other over the next couple months to, to see who can get a better score. Um, right now, Jenna is beating me because she's more disciplined. So I'm uh, definitely a loser in the clubhouse, but I have lost a little bit, a little bit of weight down to a, a healthy 213 off my peak at the start of the year at 223. So got a little bit more ways to go. 10 pounds. That's impressive, Tim. So is this like challenge? This seems kind of like hard 75, but maybe it's like moderate 30. <laughs> yeah, maybe <laughs> like the uh, the soft 30. I don't know what you would call this one. Ty, what's, uh, let's check in with you. What's What's your routine looking like? Yeah, I mean, the biggest change since really listening to Huberman a lot more is previously, uh, you know, we were both super into CrossFit. So kind of combining weightlifting and cardio is, you know, at a high level what you're what you're doing there. And after listening more to, to Huberman, I've really focused on having true cardio days and then having true lifting days. So I've really like broken those up. And that's been a huge, huge help, I think, for from a fitness perspective is just I have the days I follow a program to a different program, a better program than you, but I do full body lifting three to four days a week. And then on the other days, I'm doing cardio and I'm doing either a longer cardio day, like a long run with my wife or doing interval training. So that's really what I've been doing lately and I've been loving it. It sounds great, Ty. But for the record, I think everyone knows that I hold a higher PR on most of the lifts than you do. <laughs> what's your mile time i've not run a mile in a very long time i think i would be uh, over 10 minutes at this point i think we need to do a public fitness competition i like that i think we need to determine like a competition with 10 different events mm -hmm. we we each decide five or something we maybe we vote on them or something we got to fit or maybe it's audience participation who knows but i think we should basically create a fitness challenge and really determine who who's the fitter individual who's the fitter brother i love it i mean i think we do like the modern acre presidential challenge we have pull-ups we do lifts we do car cardio events i think it'd be great all right well <laughs> <laughs> all right tim and ty fitness challenge coming to you 
in the weeks to come. Some people do like an ag 30 under 30. Um, <laughs> we do a fitness challenge within the ag community. So I guess we'll pilot it ourselves, but I'm, I'm liking this idea, Tim. Yeah. Well, guys, we're super excited to have Anthony on the podcast. We've been wanting to chat with Swarm for a long time now to just understand what they're doing, what they're working on in AI. And uh, I think it's really exciting what they're focused on in developing AI specific for agribusiness. And so Anthony comes on, shares more about his backstory, the founding story of Swarm and how they're really deploying AI at scale, helping agribusinesses solve their unique challenges. You guys are going to get a lot out of this episode. Let's jump in with what's top of mind for Anthony. Well, I think probably the same as everybody I talk to, which is generative AI, which is just so transformational to everything. And because it is a space we live and work in, it's something I obviously understand. But I think actually for me, there's some aspects of it that are very different from the way most people are looking at it. Everyone's looking at it as, you know, creating things, being an interface and so on. But I actually think it can do a whole bunch of things that we've not considered yet. We'll delve, delve into what we do as a company and so on, but, but we have the ability to use it to be like a little consultant that can talk to people. And when you start thinking about that, you could suddenly have a hundred consultants in parallel interviewing everyone in your organization and consolidating the information and sharing it. That's something you just couldn't do before. So I actually think generative AI is top of mind because it's transforming everything we're doing. Uh, and I think if it's not top of mind for an organization, it should be. We've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while, just with all these latest developments, with your recent announcement this year about launching launching your tool. And so we're excited to hear how you guys are thinking about it, especially you know on the front lines. Having been playing in AI for uh, for a while, now it's yeah. kind of hitting mainstream. So it's going to be exciting to to jump into that. But let's let's take a step back, learn a little sure. bit more about you, um, and what ultimately led you to the food and agriculture space. Well, I guess I, I did grow up in a uh, big rural part of England uh, near Banbury, which is just outside Oxford. Um, it used to have the biggest cattle market in Europe uh, when I lived there. So I spent my summers playing in fields of barley with my friends, being chased by bulls or farmers with shotguns very frequently. But they don't like it if you build a fort out of hay, I noticed. But it's great fun as a kid. And my first job was actually a big food manufacturer, which later became Kraft Foods, so making Maxwell House coffee. Um, but I was actually a computer operator and a software developer there. So weirdly enough, I've always lived in a rural environment, but worked in technology. My journey but basically took me through multiple different roles and companies, ultimately coming back to agriculture was more by chance than planning. And we can talk about that when we talk about what Swarm is. But I had a weird career route because I chose not to go to university, um, which my peers thought was crazy um, because I wanted a job in computers because I thought computers were going to be really an amazing thing. And all the university courses were how to build a computer. And I didn't want to build one. I wanted to use one. So I went and got a job at the food company to actually use it and do things rather than just try and build a computer. Although rather bizarrely, I went back to university um, as an adult, I actually went to Oxford University and did creative writing. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a published author of both fiction and nonfiction, which I think sometimes scares the venture capitalists when I'm telling them the narrative of our company. They want to know if it's the fiction or nonfiction part. So um, I ended up doing a whole bunch of sales and sales management jobs. And at one point I came over to the US to join a company that was a uh, software startup doing data warehouse appliances. I was actually a co-founder of that with um, my current chairman, Stuart. Um, ultimately, that company got acquired by Microsoft. It was a great exit, big multiple for all of the investors. And I ended up running Microsoft's big data team in Europe, Middle East and Africa for five years. Uh, that was fantastic experience on many levels. It was very different, as you might imagine, from running a small startup. So there were some uh, challenges there too. After I left Microsoft, I came back to America uh, and was working at an incubator. And we were launching a whole bunch of companies that all specialized in AI, machine learning, and, and big data. And we were getting our ideas by talking to big corporates. 
And one day we had um, a guy called Dave Bartlett from GE came in and we got into a conversation about social machines. And the question was, what would Facebook for machines look like? And we thought that was a really interesting concept. And I took that concept, developed it within the incubator. And eventually I got so excited about the potential for solving problems, partly because a lot of what we'd done at Microsoft with the analytics platforms was highlighting problems. And the opportunity with the newest AI and the latest IoT sensor data coming in was to solve problems instead of just highlighting them. So I thought this is a great opportunity. So I ended up spinning that company out of the incubator and uh, and stepping into the CEO role, which I have to say was never the original plan. I was actually very happy being a consultant advising others. Um, so it was it was definitely a step out of my comfort zone to to do the CEO role. Well, what an awesome background and journey you have ultimately le- leading you to to Swarm. So maybe let's talk about the early days. You come out of the incubator with this idea. You're stepping into the CEO role. What did the early days look like in terms of building the product, assembling the team, and really figuring out your go-to-market strategy for the company? Yeah, in the early days, we knew we wanted to solve combinatorial math problems, which sounds very techy and, and geeky. But it was because we knew that the latest AI and the new reinforcement learning algorithms in particular could solve problems that hadn't been solved before. And we also knew there was this wave of new data coming in. And we were seeing uh, lots of examples where people just couldn't solve problems with this new wave of data. Sometimes when you get more data, it's harder to solve a problem than less data. We actually did some work at Microsoft with a big wind uh, turbine company and they used to get 100 pieces of data every uh, every minute from each wind turbine, each mast. And all of a sudden, it went up to 1,000 pieces of data per millisecond. That type of data, you should, in theory, be able to make great decisions with all that new data. But actually, what it really does is just overwhelm your process for handling data. So we saw there was an opportunity to do something with combinatorial maths, with the latest AI and reinforcement learning and this new wave of data coming in. But I have to say, we didn't start with agriculture. We actually looked at a whole range of different industries. So we thought smart cities would be a great place. We could solve, you know, traffic management. Uh, We looked at managing fleets of drones to do the sort of stuff you see at Super Bowl now. And uh, we looked at a whole range energy. How do you... um, Uh, distribute the energy more efficiently as the grid becomes decentralized, which is what will happen as people start to have their own power sources and so on. So we looked at all of these different areas, but all of them had challenges for a startup. There's no point trying to sell to a city if you're a startup because multiple authorities, by the time you've got your first deal, you'd have run run out of money. And by chance, another company that had been in the incubator were doing work on track and trace problems in agriculture. And they were actually working with General Mills on um, doing track and trace for grain in Cheerios. Uh, And they had a problem there on blending the grain because you have to blend the grain away to uh, make sure that the Cheerios stay a gluten-free product. You have to get rid of the barley, which gets uh, contaminates the, the grain. And they had 40 silos and you could blend three of them. And there are 10,000 combinations if you do that. So they had a spreadsheet to say what the best uh, blend was. They had another site with 200 silos and they wanted to blend eight. And that's 85 trillion combinations. And as they said, the spreadsheet doesn't handle this very well. (laughs) So uh, if you ever tried an 85 trillion row Excel spreadsheet, you'll, you'll guess why. So it was a great fit for us. We were able to solve that problem. Um, and show how we could use uh, uh, an AI algorithm underneath uh, our platform to actually uh, make a great blending choice very quickly. And we started to look at agri-food and say, well, hang on, there are lots of people who have blending problems. And actually, there's lots of similar problems in the supply chain. And there are also lots of challenges for the agri-food industry. Uh, Obviously, you know, as farmers yourselves, you know a lot of the challenges, the costs, The fact that plant based, uh, you know, alternative proteins are coming in, the changing perspectives of what people, consumers actually want, um, you know, the global supply chain, there's a whole range of things. So it felt like a a classic burning platform. And at the same time, farmers were being forced to undergo a digital transformation and start to put, you know, arable units in the field and use robots like Buro and people to, to pick things and help out with the work there. So it felt like there was a wave of new data 
there was a burning platform and it was something that the technology we built was really going to be good at fixing. So we switched all of our focus exclusively to agri-food supply chain. So take us through those next steps, right? So you decided, hey, we're going to we're going to double down, we're going to go all in on agri-food. How are you managing like the advances happening in AI and LLMs and all of these different technologies that were advancing and figure out how you were going to create a product to go to market? Talk us through that next phase. Sure. So the first thing we did is we realized because we were looking at uh, sensor data based on the edge of things, we realized that we wanted an agent based system so that each of those edge devices potentially could have an individual agent that represented it. I have to say, we thought we were going to be having our software running on small devices, you know, in farmers fields, on trucks and so on. But what we discovered very quickly was everyone takes the data and pulls it into the cloud. So um, we did have an agent system, but it ran in the cloud. So essentially, we built an agent system and we did one very smart thing early on, which is we didn't build it to solve a specific problem because we didn't know what the problem was. We didn't know whether it would be blending or allocation or supply and demand balancing, you know, optimization of transport, whatever it would be. So what we did is we built the infrastructure for the agents, if you like, the ecosystem, but we didn't put a brain into the agents. And the brain is the algorithm. And we discovered there are thousands of algorithms. They're they're commodities. They're just, you can pick up algorithms open source from academic institutions. You can write one. They're very easy to get hold of. What was hard to do was to put the infrastructure around it so you just plug an algorithm in and have it work with the data you fed the machine, if you like. So we really built an, uh, an agent algorithm engine where we could plug in an algorithm based on what we thought the problem was. And the second piece we built was we built a dashboard so that anybody could use it. Because we discovered when you go and talk to the operation person in a agri-food company about multi-agent systems with reinforcement learning, their eyes glaze over and they're not really you know, interested. They just want to know what to blend or they want to know which product to allocate to which production line or you know, they want an answer to their problem. They don't care about the technology being used. So we had an engine where we could plug in whatever solution we needed. We had a dashboard that let people interact with it in a really simple way. And importantly, let the end user still remain in control. So if I'm that guy doing the grain blending, I I need to be able to say, hey, this elevator's broken, or tomorrow I'm gonna clean this elevator because I've got an inspector coming around and I need to empty the thing out so I can clean it. So I need to be able to override the system, but still get good results. So we actually built the dashboard so the end user, the human is still fully in control of the process and the AI is there to support and help them, not to replace them. So that was a really important step as well. But I think the third step is the most critical, and I think it's what makes us unique. And we came to it over several years, I have to say. It wasn't a, an overnight thing. It was this. Every time we went somewhere, we didn't know anything about cotton or grain or tomatoes or blueberries. We're not experts in agri-food. We were experts in technology and data and AI. So it took us a long time, every project we did, to understand the problem. And after a while, we said, surely there's a better way of defining a problem. Isn't there a standard way of defining a problem? And I'd actually, by chance, I'd written a book a couple of years before on questions. So I was very much thinking about the way we use questions to uh, understand problems and get information. So we actually devised a way to define, um, we called it a challenge because nobody wants to list a whole bunch of problems in their company or their farm. They want, uh, they want some challenges they can meet. They don't want to know here are 50 problems you've got. So we called it the challenge modeler. And what we did is we built it so that you could, as an everyday business user, you could define a problem in straightforward business language. We've got 60 or so templates in there. Um, for all of the common supply chain problems. And they look a bit like Mad Lib grids. So you can just fill in the blanks. You know, we have blank carriers delivering food to blank customers and you can fill in the numbers and you can edit them, delete them. You can start without a template if you want. But the idea was let's give a structure around what does a challenge look like? What's the scale of the problem? Uh, How do we solve it today? What would the business impact be if we could solve it? What are the constraints? What's the goal? What are the levers that we can control to improve this process? 
So we put a standard approach to doing this in, and then we've given that tool away for free. Anyone can download it and just define a problem. Once you've defined it, it produces a beautiful PDF, sort of seven or eight page document that says, here's my problem, here's my challenge. And the nice thing about that is you can use that anywhere. You could send it around to other people. You know, you could send it to your brother. You could send it to, uh, you know, a supplier, or you can send it to us at Swarm. And we can use the metadata to rapidly deliver a solution in that engine. So we actually use, because this, we know the structure, we can use the underlying data to really quickly deliver a solution. But the key thing about doing this is, instead of having every time you have a problem in your business, you just think, oh, what are we doing? How do we solve it? You have a standard approach and a standard framework to model out the problem. And I'll give you a tiny analogy on this. Way back when I was uh, writing software code at Kraft Foods to, to do picking lists in the warehouse and stuff, the code was very much what we would call at the time spaghetti. In other words, it was an art form. You could write the code any way you want. You know, there were some ideas about subroutines and structure, but really it was just an art form. You did it however you want. And a guy called James Martin came along, made a lot of money. He said, if, if software engineers built bridges, I would never drive over one um, because it, there was no rigor. There was no control. There was no, uh, no structured way of doing it. And he put into software uh, a thing he called information engineering, where software became a structured approach. And I think the same is true with problems. When you think about how you solve problems at the farm or how you solve problems in your business, everybody just does it in a random creative way. Someone does it with an Excel spreadsheet. Another guy does it with PowerPoint. Somebody does it with a Word document. So what we're doing is saying, what if we had a standard structured way to define a challenge? What it means is, A, you get better at doing it, B, it's repeatable, and C, it can feed an AI engine that starts to learn how to solve your problems much more effectively. So I think that's the really unique thing we've done. We've said there needs to be structure around how you define your problems. And whether we're the solution or somebody else is, it doesn't matter. You're going to get better at solving challenges. Super interesting. I think standardizing how people in the supply chain ask questions is really interesting to think about. And Anthony, you want to kind of like dig into to your tool. You announced the AgriFood Virtual Advisor right around World Agritech. So yep. that's been a few months back. Talk to us about how the adoption has gone and what kind of interesting challenges you're seeing customers onboarded onto the platform. Absolutely. So we announced it uh, a couple of months ago. We are actually we have one customer that we're working with to deliver this at the moment before we launch it fully in the market, um, probably the end of this year. So I'll tell you what we're doing with it. And there, there's several technical pieces. So fundamentally, right now, I can go into our platform and I can have a conversation with a digital agent sitting on top of our platform and I can ask it questions. And we're using ChatGPT, one of the ChatGPT engines underneath. We could use any LLM. That's just, you know, it's a choice, just like we choose different algorithms. So I can go into the tool, have a conversation. That's great. What we're actually using Ava to do is much more interesting. We're building a uh, knowledge model for an organization. We're actually using some graph technology. So we're building a knowledge model for every organization that we deal with. So really what our virtual agent is doing is not just chatting. She's chatting with a purpose. And the purpose is to understand the business and what your challenges are so we can solve them. So if you think about it, I mentioned earlier, we have 60 or so templates for standard supply chain problems. Well, a lot of them have some commonality. So if you're looking at inbound and outbound logistics, well, guess what? They're both gonna to want to know how many warehouses you've got. So instead of asking that question twice and having Ava just you know interview somebody and fill in the challenge definition, what we realized is we need to merge all of the templates we have uh, and create a knowledge model so we know how many, how many facilities you have, how many uh, sales orders you get per day, uh, who the various people are as the warehouse managers. So we build a model. So what Ava is actually doing is interviewing people in the business to build a knowledge model. And then she's making recommendations about how she could solve those challenges for you. So when you've seen the original announcement, what we were actually talking about doing was simply having Ava build the challenge definition talk to you about agri-food um, challenges and so on. We've actually taken it a lot further and we're actually letting her build a unique model for each customer. And we're testing it with the first customer. I should also say we're doing it in multiple languages. 
And once we've got that proven out, we're going to roll it out to all of the other customers, probably say end of this year, beginning of next year. Uh, and I think for me, coming back to where we started this conversation, this is transformational. This is, if I'm a system, big system integrator, I'm going to be scared by this because this is an agri-food expert who understands your business and never forgets anything you tell her and is learning and improving all the time. I think the power of this over the next year or two is going to just move certain organizations that are adopting this technology to the next level. Maybe give you an example of that. When you think about when the internet came out and the booksellers were thinking, maybe we should do something about this. And Amazon came along and, you know, they just took over because they had a different model. The food retailers were like, yeah, that's great, but that's just books until they acquired Whole Foods. And suddenly everybody woke up and said, oh, actually, Amazon just isn't books. It's something else. And it's a very, very different model. And they've been able to become huge and, and transform and disrupt many industries because of this new model. I would argue you're going to see the same in food. Uh, and it's going to be some new models that some of the companies adopt that take them from, you know, 10th or 50th place in the market to being a top two or three percent our company in the next few years. I think it's that big a deal in terms of the, if you, if you had something that could identify problems in your business and solve them automatically and keep getting better at it, just think how rapidly your business would change. Totally. It's, it's really exciting stuff. And I think just, you know, you, you see at a, at a very small level, just personally, how, you know, leveraging chat GPT kind of supercharges what you're able to accomplish. If you have a, you know, robust uh, solution that is building a, like you said, a, a database for your specific company and providing specific recommendations and solutions to save money, improve efficiency. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it supercharges the company, like you said. Anthony, want to kind of wrap up this section, just talking about running a startup um, in 2023. Tell us a little bit about how things are going and how you're thinking about profitability and revenue as you get your your product launch about you know raising in in this climate can you kind of speak to where you're at and how you're thinking about that absolutely so at the beginning of this year we had a target of raising a series a probably about 15 to 18 million um this summer and uh, we presented that to the board in january and most of our board are you know vcs and investors and they were like, there is no way you're going to do that because we're not we're not doing that with any companies. We're just not investing. The market's crashed. So we recommend you do a bridge instead. And originally, we looked at doing a bridge to the Series A. But actually, as we modeled out where we were going in the trajectory, and, and we'd actually just launched the Challenge Modeler, uh, and we were starting to see people really pick that up, and, and it was accelerating our pipeline, and we were getting new, new people adopting it. So actually, what we modeled was a bridge to break even. Uh, and we closed our bridge uh, two weeks ago. It's probably the longest funding round I've done, even though it was existing investors. It was still very uh, just difficult process in this climate. The investors we got have been wonderful and were great, very supportive, but it still took a lot of time to get through the process. So we closed the bridge. Uh, we've had in total about 10 million in funding to date. We will reach break even now at some point next year, depending upon how many customers we close and when. But what that actually means is it takes runway and uh, all those things off the table. So we're still going to go and do a Series A, and we're going to start the Series A in September because we don't need the money, but the opportunity is there to grow the company much faster. Uh, and we see a huge opportunity around what we're doing with Ava and the, the knowledge models that we just described. And we're seeing in the market right now, I saw some great stats just uh, this week about the fact that in Q1, the average... Uh, so the median value, to be accurate, for pre-money valuation for a, a startup looking for Series A was about 35 to 40 million. And right now it's gone up to 70 million again. So I think what we're looking at is had we tried to raise money at the beginning of the year, we'd probably have run out. It was a great decision by the board to um, to do the bridge. We're now in a strong position. We've actually closed a couple of customers in the last month as, as well. So we've got great growth runway into the future and we've got a platform that is getting people very excited so we're we're going to kick off that series a um first of september and i'm hoping uh, we'll we'll be doubling in size by this time next year exciting times 
Anthony, we're going to switch gears here a little bit to our rapid sure. fire round. Starting out, starting out with a fun one. What's your food and ag hot take? One thing I've learned in the last few years is that half the people believe in one thing and half the people believe in the other thing, whatever it is. So it's very hard to find something that most people don't believe in. But I think many technology firms believe that agri-food isn't mature enough in data to really take advantage of AI. But I think AI itself is going to solve that problem. We see a bit like where mobile phones just enabled third world countries to leapfrog the uh, wired telephone systems that people were expecting them to put in. I think things like Ava is great at capturing tribal knowledge. So just because you don't have all the data in a third normal form relational database doesn't mean that data doesn't exist in the organization. So I believe that agri-food is going to rapidly jump up the AI curve by using some of these new generative AI technologies and will get much further forward than many technology firms think is possible. Anthony, obviously you're leveraging the latest in technology every day in your business. Other than direct AI, what emerging companies or categories are you keeping an eye on and following? So uh, there's a couple of things. One is... The chat GPT stuff is chat based. It's text based at the moment. I'm a big fan of Synthesia, which do the video avatars. Ava was built with uh, Synthesia. Um, but right now we can't do real time text to video. You have to render them. So I'm following that very closely. They actually had a very big funding round recently, and I'm hoping they're going to launch their, um, uh, you know, a real time version of that. So you can have a real time video interface as opposed to purely chat. So that's one thing. And the other on a completely different thing is flying cars. I, uh, I got a lapsed pilot's license. I don't really want to go through the whole thing again, but I want an autonomous flying car that I can just zip around the country. In. And, and let, let's face it, that's getting a lot closer than, uh, than we think. Anthony, what's a big prediction you have in food and agriculture over the next five to 10 years? What we were talking about earlier, I think people will actually change the way they look at solving problems. Einstein famously said that if he had an hour to save the, the world, he'd spend the first 55 minutes defining the problem and the next five solving it. And I think we've gone completely away from that. We spend most of the time looking at solutions and not really thinking about what the problem is. So my big prediction is I think people will transform the way they look at the problems they have um, and how to solve them. I think challenge management is going to be huge. What's something you've changed your mind about? So not to be political. But the percentage of the population that believe in anything, such as whether to get vaccinated or not, to, to take one simple example, I think I always thought most people were rational and they were outliers with extreme ideas. And I've, I've completely reversed that. It seems like anything is half the population believe one thing and half the population believe the other. It doesn't matter what, what your belief is, it just seems like we are split. And it's not just America, although it sometimes feels like that. I've seen the same in other countries. So I think I, I've changed my mind about that. And one other thing, I, I've changed my mind at the pace at which generative AI is happening. You know, even though I followed AI for years, I think everybody has been caught by the speed at which that has suddenly improved. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that shocked me. Anthony, what's a common mistake you see people in the AI space making? I think the most common mistake is the fact that other people understand what they're talking about. There's been so much stuff about chat GPT being intelligent and people, you know, looking at Terminator style events and occurrences and all the, all the sci-fi movies, which have been great. But I think if you understand what the LLMs do, there isn't actually any real intelligence in there at all. So I think there's a lot of confusion still around this. And I don't think people in our field are very good at uh, explaining what it really does, partly because it's very technical. So I think that's a big, a big challenge, uh, really explaining it so people aren't frightened of it, um, but people can see the benefits, but understand enough how it works. Totally. Well, Anthony, last question here. What's saving your life right now? I was going to say running chocolate and red wine, although not necessarily in that order, would be the, uh, the, the key things that uh, give me some release. I do play a classical guitar every evening as well, um, which is great for clearing your mind of anything other than the complex set of notes you've got to play. I think we all need a little bit of downtime as well, no matter how hard we work. 
Totally. Well, Anthony, this has been a ton of fun. Thanks for coming on the podcast. As we wrap up here, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Swarm? Uh, probably the easiest way is LinkedIn. I'm obviously on LinkedIn and uh, we can give you the links for that. Uh, and if they really want to take a look at the questions book or even the fiction, that's all on Amazon as well. I've got my author page up there too. So Tim, what'd you think? Super fun conversation with Anthony. Loved hearing about his background and journey into the agribusiness space. And I think his background just in terms of asking questions is really appropriate for AI and giving prompts. He talked about the book that he wrote, questions, really asking good questions, you get better information back. So I think that's an interesting background to have when you're starting this kind of company and really cool to see the traction that they're getting, really solving challenges within the supply chain. Totally. I mean, with all these AI developments, Tim, on Twitter, it's like what is on my feed is people sharing how they're asking good questions to chat GPT. Like it's like full of my feed and it's become, yeah, this, this new space, this new industry of like prompt engineering, which is just mm-hmm. super fascinating. So Anthony's book questions, a user guide, we're going to give away five copies of that book. So all you have to do is give us a rating and review on the podcast player of your choosing send it to us in a screenshot and email it to tyler at the and that's all you have to do the first five to do that we will send you a copy of questions the amazon bestseller by anthony so definitely be sure to do that we'll link all the details in the show notes and we'll talk to you guys next week